Um, I know everyone uh, is, uh, you know, interested to hear what uh, the August. Thank you. The August body on this panel has to say. Um, first, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jeff Stundell. I'm the publisher and editor for uh, WTF Books. Laugh. Um, before I give my introductory, introductory statements, I want to allow the people on the panel to introduce themselves. We'll start from the right. I'm Gary Rowan. Um, I'm actually from the left because I'm a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I've been in this business since the 1970s, and it never ceases to amaze me at many of the stupid things that writers do, publishers do, and all kinds of things. Uh, I write short stories as well as reviews. and. Uh, I have been an agent, but don't take very much because of what I've had to deal with, and I'm a publishing consultant. I'm Robert Cordray. I'm an author of Memoirs of the Haunted Man series. I also do uh, informational guides, Zombies 101, Knowledge of Survival, and uh, Zombies 101, Frequently Asked Questions. My name is Alicia Sands, and my very first book is coming out November 1st on Amazon.com. Uh, it's named Bayou, Bayou La Bea, so look it up. And uh, Rob Fox and I are writing a uh, book of short stories about beastly endeavors and cryptozoology. Should be out at uh, beginning of next year. I'm Hugh Howie. I wrote the Wool series and iZombie, and I've been writing um, well since I was 12, and actually completing stuff for the last four years. And um, <laughs> so I've been really excited about this panel, and thanks for showing up. Okay, as I said, I'm going to give a couple of introductory statements, and for all of you Trekkies out there, like the Gorn, I will keep it merciful and sh brief. <laughs> um, I allowed the writers here to introduce themselves because I think that one of the things that the publishing industry has lost sight of, the traditional publishing industry, has lost sight of is, are these people. The writers are what makes the publishing industry tick. Without us, there's nothing to publish. Unfortunately, the nature of the publishing industry is, like a lot of things in the economy today, contracting. At one time, there were 22 major publishing houses. Now we're down to seven. And as current events show, that will probably contract even further. What that contraction means is that as the publishing companies shrink, they start letting go of people. And as you let go of more and more professionals, that means you have overburdened editors who don't have the time to properly evaluate the talent. They don't have the time to properly edit the books. The other thing also is that there is a disconnect between the readers and the writers. I think that the publishing companies, for the most part, kind of want to dictate what is going to be read. I think that the readers are not being given the credit to which they're due. That there are a lot of things that readers would like to read, but they're not being heard from. From the same standpoint, the writers have things that they want to write, but they're not having an opportunity to write. Why? The focus of most of the publishing houses has been on their big names. Okay, you know, you can put out a big name here, a big name there, and you're going to make a splash. But historically, where most of a publishing house's money comes from, revenue comes from, mid-list to mid-top list writers. And yet those are the ones who get lost in the shuffle. Those are the ones who aren't getting properly promoted. Those are the ones who wind up, as they used to say, you know, going over the transom in order to get into the publishing houses. Um, perfect example is someone like John Kennedy Toole, who wrote Confederacy of Dunces. He died committed suicide. His mother was the one who got the book published because she basically brought it in and said, please, read these mimeograph sheets, turn into a Pulitzer Prize winner. People like myself and other self-publishers, people who are trying to kind of change the paradigm, we don't want to see the people on this panel or the writers out there, we don't want you to be published posthumously. We want you to get your credit now for all of the things that you can provide to the readers out there. A lot of people have been self-published. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe, um, Rudyard Kipling, Virginia Woolf. I mean, where would the world be without James Joyce's Ulysses to make us all go, huh? That's not a so, good example. That's no, that is but, a terrible example. But I'm saying that's, that's self, Beatrix Potter self-published. 
Tom Clancy, Hunt for Red October, okay? Major motion picture. It ended up being published by the Naval Printing Authority or something to that effect because he couldn't get it published anywhere else. John Grisham, Time to Kill, couldn't get it published. Catch-22, believe it or not, wait for it, it was rejected 22 times by publishing houses. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm usually the one with a bunch of traditional publishers, and I'm the self-publisher trying to say, hey, things are okay from my side, but you know, I, I guess I'm gonna have to balance out what you're saying. Mm -hmm. with, um, there's some changes this year that are really heartening from big publishers. The, the music industry went through this, and they finally relented and gave Apple the right to sell their songs one at a time for 99 cents. It's benefited all of us. And big publishers are now seeing what you guys are reading and they're snatching it up. Uh, the reason Fifty Shades of Grey got picked up, it came off a fan fiction website. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wh whatever you think about it, it's what obviously what people want to read. It was what they were reading before they published it. Um, I've got a lot of friends on uh, various writers' forums who are self-published. As soon as their book goes into certain, and, and this happened with, with my books, as soon as they hit certain um, sales ranks, publishers came and made offers. So. I think they're, they're scared, but that's kind of good. They're learning from it, and I don't think they're going to go away. I just think, you know, you guys um, finding what you want to read and, and being vocal about how much you love it is going to help change this industry as much as we are. Well, I think a, a point to that is that what's happening here is that more and more and more people are attempting that self-publishing, doing their all of the legwork, all of the legwork to get themselves to that point. And then the publisher's like, oh, well, you've done all that work. Let me go ahead and give you that little nudge. But they're, you know, <laughs> if they're showing you a pile of cash while they're doing it, Just I think most yes. people are like, yes, please, my legs are exhausted. Like, please take over, you know. But what are some of the other experiences? Well, you forgot one major player in the self-publishing. That is L. Frank Baum, Wizard of Oz. That's he right. Couldn't get it published, couldn't get it published. He did it himself. And look at the, the effect afterwards, the movies. Different movies. Uh, there's two that I know of uh, that are, are talking movies. There's uh, silent ones, and you know, self-publishing. So self-publishing has always had been a black eye, but the thing is, it is now because some of the people don't do certain things. They don't get it edited. They just put it out, and that hurts the industry. Uh, there are others who just uh, they don't uh, have it edited for content. So they just, they're telling a story in fiction and they don't do what I require as a reviewer and uh, the times I've been an editor, I mean not editor, but agent, uh, I require that you tell a story with the beginning, middle and end. And one of the prime examples was Speed Demon that I got published and I walked off the project because I didn't like the attitude of my writer who said, I am a prize winning journalist and I won't be treated this way. And what she was talking about was she didn't like some things in the contract with Kensington. Her book got published as a result, but my input was not there to work with that author. And here's the difference that you see from my dad's book, Evidence of Murder, and um, Rattlesnake Romeo, that was a project with Kensington also that I worked on. And the difference is there's a formula to writing true crime. This author didn't follow it. And she had her major book published, but I don't think she's ever uh, done anything else. And so one of, the, one of the things to you as prospective writers or writers is don't give so much attitude. Yeah, Self-publishing is becoming an easier project to uh, attempt and accomplish these days. The electronic media, the forums that are out there that you know, help you review your books prior to publish, and just the format of putting them online uh, as a simple download for a Kindle or uh, any PDF type files is becoming incredibly easy, which expands the amount of competition that's out there. So you have to be a little sharper, follow the rules a little bit better, and also do that pre-work. Make sure your paperwork, as far as it being properly added, punctuation, grammar, tense, all these things story prior. Content. Yes, yeah, story, your story content prior to self-publishing because you put one mistake mm -hmm. out there and it takes a whole lot of attaboys to make up for it and, and in this world of instant gratification it just doesn't happen. And it's very interesting you say that because I know that we brought up 50, 50 Shades of Grey and um, look 
This is not to bore anyone. I have two degrees in English. Big deal. <laughs> but I studied Victorian pornography when I was in grad school. How proud was my mother? And, <laughs> you know, when you read Victorian pornography, it's well-written porn, okay? Yeah, it is. There is, to Gary's point, a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's well-written. There, it is grammatically correct. It's stylistically correct. You're interested in what the characters are doing. You know, that's the key component of any book, and I think everyone would agree here. If you don't care what the characters are doing, you don't care what they're doing to themselves or each other. And, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of writers and a lot of publishers, making sure that all your T's are properly crossed and your I's are dotted, I mean, that is crucial. I was talking, I've spoken to a couple of people out there who, for whatever reason, have brought that book up as just being the hallmark of what not to do with self-publishing. Yes, it, it's blown the doors out, no pun intended. I, I want it. I mean, that's, that, that she, right. E.L. James has made you know, oh, hundred, hundreds absolutely. of millions of dollars this year. And that's not, you know, that means that she can now go write poetry for the rest of her life if she wants. She, exactly. She but how many of you are want to be writers? Are you guys in this panel because you're, you're writing and now how do I publish? You know, <laughs> you know, it's a, you have to win the lottery either way. It's not like one of these is going to be a road to riches and the other isn't. It's, you have the same chances almost mm -hmm. on, either, on either avenue. I've got friends with ma major cup book contracts and they don't get re-upped and they have to keep their day jobs and you know, they're with the big six publisher. It, you just don't have any guarantees in this and that's not why you go into it. But you're talking about whether or not a book is well written or you care about the characters. I, I look at plot and prose as two very different things. Readers seem to care more about plot than prose. They, you know, literary fiction just doesn't sell. It's very beautifully written, and it's not what readers want. But Dan Brown and, and E.L. James and, and James Patterson, people that we, we, I don't know, I don't know if it's jealousy on the part of writers, but people love to look down on how these books are written. Readers are gobbling them up. It's the stories they want to read. So look at your own writing, and, and are you agonizing over making the sentences perfect? Or are you writing plots that are compelling, that make you want to turn the page, and you don't even see the typos because you're reading it so fast? Well, here's a question. How many people out there, when you read a book, if you see a typo or something that's grammatically incorrect, how many of you just, as writers, kind of go, mm, when you see it in a book? Raise of hands. <laughs> okay, I'd say that was a quorum. And that's not to, to but you're absolutely right. But right. I, I agree. You don't make it through the third page if you don't, if you, if you're like, you know, my wife read a book recently and she was like, these characters are despicable. I, there's nothing likable about mm -hmm. these guys. And, you know, not anybody on this forum. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you're not going to get five pages in, you're not going to find the typos anyway. So, right. Uh, they're both important, but which is more important? If you look at what sells, it looks to me like the readers kind of say, I, the story trumps the, the writing. And, get get know, rid of the typos, but like, right. your, your shining grammar is really not what... Well, you've hit a very good point, and I think that's, as writers, one of the things that we have to understand is to be able to connect with the readers. What do the readers want? And the way that, and we've talked about this, mm -hmm. the new paradigm, the traditional ways of getting books reviewed and um, analyzed and everything else under the sun in newspapers doesn't really happen anymore. Now it's an immediate electronic response to your book, whether it's on Amazon, Goodreads, your website, whatever the case might be. Gary and I were talking about that. Why don't you yeah. talk a little bit more about it? Well, you're right. What's happened in the uh, newspaper industry is uh, they used to have up here a person who was the book editor, book review editor. <coughs> she or he has been kicked out and now they buy from media services and they run different reviews. Uh, I read a review in the Daytona Beach News Journal recently of the newest uh, Robert Parker, uh, Jesse Stone. I loved it and I reviewed it. My review is out and up at uh, uh, MidwestBookReview.com and other places. And the reviewer there just couldn't bring himself to say it's really good. Now, what I like about it is it's the screenwriter who wrote many of the screenplays for the Jesse Stone movies that Tom Stella stars in. He's been picked, he's done two books now. Uh, the name of the book is Fool Me Twice, and I love it because 
I have been a fan of Parker for many, many years, and when he introduced Jesse Stone, this uh, uh, new author kept the focus of the dialogue and the snappiness of Jesse Stone, and it's like reading a Parker. So to point out another thing, certain reviewers have certain books they like, uh, certain authors they like. Sidney Shelton was one that, that would get panned by reviewers, but the public likes. I don't have that, that affinity. I don't like literary books. I like books that everybody's reading. I just ask you to do one thing. Tell me a story with a beginning, middle, and an end, and logically conclude it. I don't have to like your characters, but what's happening in the industry is the newspapers are going to the wayside. And in that process are the reviewers, and I'm one of those, when I come to a convention and I talk to you, I will size you up as a, as a writer. And if I like what I see, I'll give you my business card. Depending upon what you do with that business card, I will either take that business card back, as I did today with a particular author, and I won't say who, but I thought, you asshole, do you know how many thousands of people read my columns? And I say columns because I have at least seven different publications. Now, when you turn down a reviewer, you're turning down, I think, let's see, one publication may have 50 to 100,000 readers. You've turned down, if, if, if multiply, do, do the math, as they say in the in politics. Do the math and what do you come up with? Now, you can't afford to alienate one single person. And yet, another author that was here, I walked up and I sized this one up. This person didn't even have the courtesy and decency to talk to me while this person was talking to somebody that person was sitting with. Do you think I'm going to consider that person? No, I'm not. So when a person says they review, you jump on it and give them a copy or you find a way to get that book to them because you're alienating yourself. And these days, the major publishers aren't going to do it for you. So when you're at a convention like this and you meet an author or you meet somebody who tells you that they're going to review you, you don't alienate them. Another story is I've met romance writers for, for 25 years. I've reviewed romance writers. That's coming to an end because this, most recently, this year, I met 14 authors, 14, mind you, at one function. Not one, not one of 14 sent me their books. And in fact, one had a kid's book and she sent me a, a news press release about it when I talked to her. I talked to her and I said, can I review your book? She said, well, uh, da, 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 da. I said, can we figure where we met? And she told me, and then she says, I threw away all my business cards and I just keep the, ad the email addresses and the phone numbers. You wanna be stupid, be stupid, but don't do it in this business. But are we, are we talking yeah. about, I mean, do we, I feel like, I don't know if people showed up to decide what to do when they finish their manuscript, like self-publishing or big publishers, or we just, you know, I. Well, I think that that's really what we're trying to, to kind of like let everyone here know is, you know, you have a choice. You can either try and throw in your lot and go with a big publisher, or you can try and do it yourself or go with a small publisher. I think that's really what this is going towards. But I think it's also important to understand as a, if you're self-publishing or if you're going with a small independent press, you know, what, you know, what is on you in order to do it? Yes, when you go with a big publisher, you're getting the opportunity to get everything that they provide. You're getting all their PR, you're getting their marketing, you're getting their editors, you're getting this and that and the other thing. The only thing is you have to hope and you and I had talked about this, you have to hope that the big publisher is going to get behind your work and is going to stay behind your and work. And they're likely not. I mean, uh, right. uh, if you just look at the numbers now, I think it's like 2% of, of traditionally published books are considered successes as far as the publisher is concerned. They pay for most of the rest. The uh, advance you're looking at now as a first-time author is likely in the $5,000 range, and a lot of books won't make that out. So that'll be the only $5,000 you get for the book. Now, there's also been this huge survey of self-published authors recently, and what they found was the, the average that they made a year was 10,000, but that was heavily skewed by the number of people who made hundreds of thousands. 
the um, the mean was like five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. That's what you could kind of expect to make in a year. The way I look at it, you own the rights forever. So you make five hundred dollars a year. You're going to be pushing the book the rest of your life. The publisher is going to push it for a six month window. Once it gets returned from the bookstores and gets remaindered, no one's pushing your book. You know, but you it might be out of print. You can push it and. And that's it. Go to a used bookstore. And that's exactly it. You never, <laughs> you never have a backlist when you're a self-publisher. As Hugh said, you're always in print. You can always publish. The, explain, the, explain a remainder, though. Yeah, what, I used to, yeah. I, my day job was uh, worked in bookstores until I, you know, was fortunate enough to write full time. But um, it was really the saddest part of my job was boxing up the unsold books and sending them back to publishers. And it's the only retail, I don't know if there's anything else like this, where you can, all the books that we bought um, wholesale, we could send back to the publisher for a full refund. So it didn't behoove us to choose carefully what we ordered. Well, that's or, the hard uh, Everything. Everything. Paperback. Okay. That's everything. everything. They ripped the cover of the paperback. Even off. then you get, yeah. Your yeah. Full, you get all your money back. Mm -hmm. So um, every six months we would send back everything that we'd order that hadn't sold. You had six months sitting spine out in a bookshelf you know, with all these other books, no one's even looking there. They're in the center aisle, they're at the bestseller list. And we talk about how you get swamped as a self-published author. You know, 500,000 books will be published this year because of the self-publishing revolution. Yeah, you're, you're hidden. You're also hidden in a bookstore, right? I see uh, um, an author in the audience who has a book in almost every bookstore, and I used to shelve that book, and I know, like, I had to take people to that book and say, here, buy this, because <coughs> the discovery process is as difficult in a bookstore that does online. And you know, it's funny, well, not so funny, I mean, to the environmentally conscious, conscious in, the, in the audience, um, a friend of mine who is an author told me what, happened, what has happened with those remainders. A lot of times those remainders go back, and at least in one case, it went to fire the furnaces of the book company. It used to be the, the yeah. standard way, and they don't know how many books are gonna sell, so they order 10,000 hardbacks. Mm -hmm. Um, there's been a, a, there's great reports online of the people whose job it was to take unopened boxes of books and throw them in a furnace. Now they, they, they pulp them now and they recycle them or they send them to a, um, a um, remainder site that sells them back to bookstores as a sale book, which, which just means they get trucked around the country five times. Anyway, you look at it, the technology they use to print this is inferior to, and this is a, the beautiful hardback that everyone wants. This is a better book because this is printed when you order it. This is print on demand. These are printed in big batches. If they don't sell, it's just a waste, you know? And the other thing also is, you know, we're looking at the books, and as I said, look, I'm a book person. I collect books, I collect, I, I love these things. These are my babies. But may I? Yes. This is what it is. This will always be what it is. As much as I love it, I hold it near and dear to my heart. I would sleep with it if I could and I didn't want to get paper cuts. <laughs> that right there, that will always innovate. As much as I love this, that will always innovate. Every couple of months, they're coming out with some new technology for the Kindle to make things easier for people to read. They're making it more accessible for the handicapped to read. Great Britain, um, they just... Um, they modified existing technology for um, optical, um, optically operated, operated computers and reading systems that are half the price of what they currently were. Why? Because now people who, can't, who couldn't hold this or couldn't even operate something like that, now all they have to do is just scan it with their eyes. As much as I love this, this will always be paper and stock. That is the future. Um, I'll give you one quick statistic. Last year, this was the American Association of Publishers, children's books, okay? 61% was the rise in the paperback hardcover um, world. 465% in ebooks. You know, the children are the future, teach them well and let them lead the way. You know, I'm not gonna sing for you, I promise. But, you know, that's going to be the wave of the future. And again, as much as I like this, and as much as these will, I don't think they'll ever, ever go away because obviously, you know, all of us have to come out and go, hey, buy our books. You know, you're not gonna sign someone's Kindle. But on the other hand, the, <laughs> well, you could sign their case if you had the silver pen. <laughs> but 
but no, I mean, all kidding aside, <laughs> that is really where, I mean, that's really where the future is. Thank you for allowing me to use that. But Alicia, I mean, you're, you, you know, you're kind of just getting yes. on this path. What's your, what are, what are your feelings about all of this? Well, the most important thing to me is try everything. If, if this is something you love, you want to put it out there, don't just say, I only want to self-publish or I only want to go with a big publisher. Um, look everywhere. You never know where you're going to find that opportunity, uh, that idea that's just going to hook everybody and you know get you known. I found my very small publisher on LiveJournal, of all places. We were in a writing competition together, and I stomped her. But <laughs> <laughs> Everyone but, leave. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you never know where you're going to meet someone that, that helps you, you know, go that direction or, or helps give you that idea or, you know, so color outside the lines, you know, just keep going everywhere. You are creative. That's the whole point of this. So not to blow sunshine up everybody, but I mean, stay positive, know what you want, know where you're going to be, not where you want to be. I wanted to be published. Last year, this is so ridiculous. So last year, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's New Year's Eve. I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm like, okay, what am I gonna do this year? And I took out my notebook and I wrote this down. I said, I will have a published book by the end of the year. Hello. <laughs> I did, did I think, you know, if I sat there, oh, maybe I will. Maybe it'll happen someday. No, it happened. It's happening this year. It's kind of exciting. So you have to stay positive. You're probably the only person to stick with your uh, yeah. New Year's resolution. So. I well, totally did. Well, with that being said, and, you know, Alicia, you know, I mean, that's very true where, you know, stick to it, say you want to write, say you want to be a writer, and go out and do it. With that being said, let me open the, uh, the floor up to questions to everyone here. You all want to be writers. What can we do to, to help you? Or you are writers and now you want to get published. <laughs> <laughs> I saw your hand go up first. <laughs> I was kind of like you, though. I mean, the the my first book coming out is just general fiction. You know, it's I love writing horror. I love writing fantasy, big time. I love writing fantasy, but this first thing just happened to be my collection of general fiction. And is it the thing I want to do all the time? No, I want to do everything. So, no, go ahead. <laughs> I honestly, everything. 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 Because you never know who's going to love what. <laughs> and it depends on what route you want to go. If there's a top down approach, you know, you don't want to cut off your options. So if, if you want to be traditionally published above, above all else, you want to be with the publishing. And I'll tell you, you know, the biggest disadvantage there is you make about 15% on your book sales versus 70% when you're um, self published. Um, you, you're giving up, you have to make six times as many sales to break even, basically. But if you want the prestige of, uh, you know, there's been articles recently that traditional publishing is the new vanity press because the biggest advantage is you're in a bookstore, you get a hardback, you feel, um, uh, you, feel yeah, you feel validated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the guys who are self published are selling the same amount of books and making a lot more money and able to write more and you know they can control their price so they don't price themselves out of the market and control their yeah. genre but if you want to be with a publisher uh, it used to be that if you self-publish you've, you've given up this mm -hmm. dream that changed in the last year and a half mm -hmm. now if you self-publish and you do well a big publisher will now come to you and offer you money and at that point we've turned down seven figure offers for a self-published work because once we got to where they made the offer we're like we're doing just fine without you so that's really what's, what's happened the last year and a half is the, the, um, that pyramid that you kind of work your way down to not close out any options has kind of inverted. To me now the default is get your work, like they say, get it edited to perfection and get it out there and prove yourself to the reader. And don't think about all the query letters and agents, that just uses up all of your time. Um, get it perfect, put it out, 
start, write, start writing your next work. It's going to be your 12th work that takes off. It is not going to be the manuscript you're working on now. It just never happens. It's yeah, but one thing, one thing you haven't pointed out is this whole idea of everybody dreams they are going to get the traditional publisher. As was mentioned, but I'll mention the names, two publishers are merging. It's bad for the industry. And the publishers are Random House, a, a German-based operation, and uh, Penguin. Putnam. Penguin. Pen Penguin. 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 Now, the other aspect is you must learn that, let's say that you go the traditional route, you get your agent, okay? You can't badger your agent because the agent is inundated with so many manuscripts. That's one. Two, when they submit it, they're going to submit it to different publishers and things happen. Uh, in the case of Del Rey, the main uh, editor for Del Rey left. So they brought in a new editor who had worked under her. But if your manuscript is there with her, with the first one, you get a 50% chance of getting it to the new agent, or the new editor. The point is, this business is super, super slow. It takes three to four years to get your book from the time you write it to the marketplace. So if you are looking to get published, self-published and the publishers like Amazon.com are so much better resources for you because eventually the publishers see, look at your sales, look at what conventions you do, look at what you do to market uh, your books, where are reviews, where, where have, have, your, have you had your books reviewed. They take all of that into consideration before making you an offer. So it comes in, the, the, the bottom line is it comes later and they say, it's the same old thing of they used to say, do your work and, and the money will come. This is the same thing. Edit, well, oh, people to edit your work to make it nice, or yeah, I mean, it, well, I, and I don't know right. if it's just because I'm in a you know online community full of other writers, but the you know, I have tons of friends that you know just throw them some throw them some money, a little a dinner, whatever. Is there a website that you can <laughs> like? Is it an open forum that they? Well, um, there are actually a lot of. I mean, there are a lot of websites for freelance editors um, who and. I can't even think of them right now. I should probably should have written them down. Um, where you can right is a that's one of them. Yep, mm -hmm. and and they're broken down by what do I edit? I edit sh short stories. Mm -hmm. I edit novels. I edit poetry. You know, and you can find people who are with you know, and you can check their credentials. You can and always ask for credentials. Ask them for you know things that they have done. Look at you know all of their background up and down because I actually was approached by um, an author here, who said that he had given his book to an editor and he wanted to give it to me because I'm I'm the publisher and editor of the of the company, and um, he said that it was a friend of his who he said you know just gave it to him and said please edit it. Didn't do a very good job, and you know unfortunately. You know, look. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm I'm God's gift to editing, but there are good ones and that there and there are bad ones, and you really have to vet them very very carefully. Another thing is you hire somebody like me who is a publishing consultant because that's one of the things I do have. Mm -hmm. I have at least eight or ten, and it grows as I meet with different people at conventions like this, and I work with you in the capacity to advise you and guide you in that respect, and so you find a publishing consultant to work with, too. Do any of you have experience with children's books? And if so, any advice on how to, I'm not a writer, I'm an artist, but I have a couple people that have written stories and want me to work with. We have no clue how to submit, like, we submit a story and follow up with art, we throw it together all at once, or can you just publish it yourself? Like, here's my art, here's the stuff on the pile. How do you, any idea how you approach that? You could actually, and, and not even to just throw this out of the room, Rob Fox, who's help, helping put together all of these panels, he has just published 
a children's book. Um, I, I'm afraid of zombies or something. Like that. But he, he and his illustrators are actually outside, and they he he self published. He put he put it together himself. I think on Create Space. It's yeah. a fantastic little book. We're actually Love it. And, you have, and you can finally do ebooks um, with children's books now because we have color readers. Before you know that wasn't open to uh, children's books. I yeah. will say children's books is that is the most brutal market to get published. Um, you, James Hume, a guy who has published over twenty other types of books, wanted to do a children's book. No publisher would touch him. He's a New York Times bestseller. He's mm -hmm. you know. 20 books published and couldn't get a deal because they say, what, what children's book have you done? Now, if you're a celebrity and you're doing it, because that's what parents want. They want someone famous, you know, writing uh, a book for their kids. Um, it's, everyone kind of has, like you've got a lot of friends who've written children's books. Everyone feels like they have a children's book mm -hmm. in them. They just can't draw. So they have a friend like you, right. <laughs> like, please do all the hard work for me. It's funny, but that's what helped me She's a teacher and she wrote the story and she loved it. She's Exactly. Yeah. I've done a children's book myself. It's called Grunge Bob Camel Pants, a Zombie Hunter. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Like I said, me and Viacom are still having words. <laughs> However, um, I, I went to my publisher with the complete book. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Shameless plug. Uh, yeah, I went to them with the complete book, with the complete illustration, the complete storyline, everything all lined up in advance. I worked with my uh, my artist uh, on the designs back and forth about what I did like about his drawings, what I didn't like about it, and brought the whole story together. And he even he even had terrific input for me on my story itself. So it's a collaborative work, but I would say approach it as a complete book, ready to go when you approach anybody or to do self-publishing. Look at it, complete work. They do take uh, old-fashioned drawings and paintings. Might happen to be in files. If you'll if you'll see me after, because yeah. I've got an idea for a children's book and I would love to write. <laughs> <laughs> I went both ways with that, and I can went through a publisher, a small company called Library of the Living Dead Press. They picked the book up as a children, and I called it a children's. I should just say children's ish book. Mm -hmm. It's from three to 103 type book. Little grunge Bob Campbell pants on zombies. It's pretty dramatic. Uh, yeah, wait a second. All right, I'm over it now. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, yep. I'd say it's age appropriate for a coffee table book. Another question? Yes. No, I'm sure they exist. but I'm yeah. sure they, well, you know, it's very funny. Um, a woman, it was a husband and wife came to our table and they were looking at one of our books and she said, is this appropriate for kids? And I said, unfortunately, there's sex violence and horrible language in there. So I would say no. Yes. Oh. But, you know, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, depending on the audience. But I mean, the, the premise of the book is it's basically, you know, just because you're different doesn't mean you're different. It means the people who are looking at you, they're the ones who have a problem, not necessarily you. And she said, you know, my child has ADHD, and this would be such a terrific book for him because, you know, it lets him know that, hey, you know, he's the one who's okay. It's the people who are teasing him that have a problem. So, I mean, there's definitely a market for it. I mean, people are looking for it. Again, to, to your question and everyone else's question, it's just a matter of getting it out there and doing searches, coming, coming to book conventions, talking to people like Gary who are publishing agents, um, and even just searching around the internet to try and find. The other thing you could do is go to, another is like, go to one of the autism um, uh, foundation websites, you know, any of the, and that would, I mean, it, that goes to any type of book that you want to do, which would be a special interest book. Mm -hmm go to the special interest website. You know, if you have something for ADHD, if you have something for Crohn's disease, you have something for, um, you know, victims of, of whatever, go to them and say, look, I have an idea. You know, cross-promoting is such a tremendous benefit because, yeah. you know, if you have a great idea and they want you to follow through on it, 
guess what? They're going to promote you out the wazoo because when you do self-publishing, a lot of it, the onus ends up being on you. But if you can get into a cross-marketing situation with, um, you know, American Cancer Society or something like that, you know, now you have another, you know, feather in your cap, so to speak. I also say, like, don't, uh, don't worry about your market so much. I, I learned this the hard way. The one work that I wrote that I thought was not commercial, it was too short, it was too depressing, I didn't promote, I didn't have a link on my website to it, has sold over 300,000 copies this year. We, it's in 19 countries now, it, and it all happened because of reader reviews and because um, it, I was wrong. I had no idea what people wanted to read. <laughs> Write what you love. It was the, the book that I loved the most that I had the least amount of faith in. So. Don't, don't write this hoping you're going to be a lottery winner. You know, write whatever you're writing because you wish that book existed. You know, it's a, it, there's a void out there and you want to fill it. Yeah. And only good things can happen, man. You'll write a book that you love. And I, I finished my first book after a conference in a panel just like this, sitting in the audience, and went home so motivated that other people had done this and they were just regular people like me. Yep. And it, it turned it all around. And so. to Hugh's point, um, Another author that I know said something very true, and I hold this to my heart many years hence. Somewhere in America is the funniest person who is, has ever lived. Unfortunately, he's a bricklayer in Indiana, and no one's ever going to hear from him. Don't be the bricklayer. Come out. Share your story. Don't be unknown. Get it out there. If you have a story, like you said, if you have a passion, if you have a story you want to tell, and you think that it's going to you know, not just impact people, but impact yourself for getting it out, follow it through, do it right every day. I get, I send my manuscripts to people who just email me and say, I want to be a beta reader. I, I do not worry about people stealing my work. It's copyrighted the moment you write it. That's the new, the new law. It's not you have to file it with anyone. It's, it's so much more, it's so much easier for your work to be copyrighted now. As soon as you write it, it's done. The other person has to prove they wrote it first. It's so difficult to do that with timestamps on documents. Um, the other thing is most people, don't tell them your idea for a great book. Don't be shy about it. Because if, they, if they're motivated enough to write a book, they don't need the idea. You know, the, the sitting down and writing the book mm -hmm. is the hard part, not the, not the good idea. And, and finally, you have to give your stuff away until someone wants to pay for it. You have to strum your guitar on the street. And, I, you know, I've made my books free for years. I've posted them on websites. Like, please, just, it, you're giving up so much of your time to read my stuff. I understand that. So, like, take it for free. You know, I will pay you to read it. And then, and that primes the pump and people like your stuff. So, uh, to start off with, just be as loose as you can with your words, just to, to capture an audience. Do not fear who you send your stuff off to. The people will steal it from you after you've already published. That, I mean, people do that now. They download books offline, copy and paste them, and then re-upload it as if they wrote it. And that's happening a lot now. So um, you don't have to worry about it while you're in the writing process. You have to worry about it much later. Right. Or say inspiring novels, how important does work get, especially if you're self-publishing versus aiming for like mainstream publishing? Anyone want to feel that? What was the question? Um, word, word, count. word count. How important is word count if you're aspiring Very. knowledge? Yeah, some publishers will touch stuff over, <laughs> over or under. Yeah. Yeah. My, whole, my whole thought is if it's a great story, I don't care how long it is. <laughs> you that's know, you as the reader, though. That's not the point. I, well, I know, but I'm just saying, you know, if, if you tell something that's that special, you know. But you know what? Know. There, there are a lot of, <laughs> but you know what? I hate to, you know, look, and I don't want to step on anyone's toes here or anyone's favorite authors, but there are some authors who got, to the, who got so famous that they became uneditable. Stephen King's The Stand turned into a monumental 1,000 some odd page Moby Dick behemoth that not even Ahab could kill and it was because Stephen King was Stephen King and exactly. you know no now and again if anyone wants to pillory me I'll be outside and I'll have the wood and the stakes yeah. um, Jay Rowling the last Harry Potter book yeah. and this I've heard from many people her work was terrific 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 and then when she got yeah. to the end the last book was just so huge that 
But that, it was, this, that's a good problem to have, though. This yeah. is this is that's, that's problems that millionaires are having. That's right, exactly. But writer. but what I'm but what I'm saying is the fact that if you know what, if you write it, they. I mean, that's my opinion. If they write it, if you write it, they will come. If you, the important thing though is, can you carry it through? And that's where working with a good editor is very important. If you write a hundred thousand word novel and you get it to an editor, and an editor goes, "My God, I was captured from yeah. you know word one." right up until the end, go for it. But yeah. also you run the risk. Okay, I got a book from Outskirts Press. They're a, a POD house, and they send me a lot of stuff. And a lot of times, I, I like the shorter books, but this one was 12 pages. I started reading it, I, I put it down. Because he didn't capture me in the first uh, paragraph, he didn't capture me in the first page, or, nor the second. And so I'm not going to waste my time with even a book that's 12 pages long. So you have to do, the, 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 the biggest thing you got to do is like Jeffrey says, you got to capture the, the editor, you got to capture the reader also. If you don't do that, that that's the primary uh, uh, thing. Second is, as I've said before, tell a story. Beginning, middle, and end. Those are the primary requirements that you have to follow. Any more any follow-ups? It's, it's also, no, I mean, I agree. <laughs> yeah, and you, you know, about word count, it's genre-specific, too. I mean, there are, if you write a fantasy novel, editors will take a 120,000-word fantasy novel. If you write young adult, they want to see right. 75,000. Now, these are, I agree, these are all ridiculous metrics. You know, they make no sense at all. But it's what the editors and agents want. So if you're going that route, you have to know their rules and abide by them. That's why, you know, again, the, the work that I thought no one would touch, it was... 50 pages long. It's, it's, it's a novel left. I mean, it's got even a, a weird name for it. So you, you don't think this is commercial. That's what readers want it, something they can read on their lunch break. You know, the, the rules are changing. If you, depending on which route you go, if you self-publish, write whatever you want. Just don't have any expectations for it. If you traditionally publish, know the rules and know that if you break them, you won't get past that first. All right, we're going to have a sing-along now. <laughs> <laughs> You do bring up a point, though, about the word count. When I first started trying to get my first book published, I made a mistake. I didn't follow what the publisher said they wanted, word for word, letter for letter, punctuation for punctuation, in their description of how to submit a, uh, your manuscript to them. And that is key. One person will want this in Arial 14 with a space and a half, no more than so many uh, lines per page. And the, you send it in to them, and they'll pick it up and go, nope, and off to the side it goes. And it's the same way when I was working with the state of California doing grant management. We had the same guidelines. People would submit documentation to us. If it wasn't on the right kind of paper in the right order, it went away. And you'll find that is what happens when you submit your uh, manuscript to publishers. Each publisher requires individual separate information so you have to follow those rules I can, they, they actually love it when you make those mistakes mm -hmm. because they have so many submissions every single day that if they have an excuse to not look at it That's they right. love that you Absolutely. might have written the, I know it sounds crazy you might have written a great story but if they can see some think about your job if you can just see some oh good I don't have to look at this one because they didn't follow the rules so they it, they don't even give it a chance and there's kind of a reason for it Mike my agent takes two new clients a year. She gets, you know, 20,000 submissions a year. So anything that she can do, if it's, you know, if it comes in on colored paper, mm -hmm. everything else is irrelevant. How great the story is is irrelevant. And it's because of the crush of numbers and just the, the reality of it. It's, it's, it's sad that it's that way, but the, the other good news, if you self-publish and you do well, the agents will call you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I got my agent. I, I got to turn down several agents before the right agent contacted me, and I think that's the way it should go. We should sell ourselves to the reader. Once we've proven that, then we should court agents and court publishers and, and work that route, and that's happening more and more often now. It's, it's easier for the publisher. This book has already been vetted. We know readers want it. We don't have to take a chance and watch 98% of what we choose not do well. So. You know, that's, that's my biggest argument for self-publishing is there's only one gatekeeper that matters. And to me, that's someone sitting on their toilet. They just finished a book. They're flipping through their Kindle. They want the next thing. You know, that's more important to me than the bookstore or the, the editor or the agent or the publisher. 
And I think that's actually where we've hit six o'clock. I think that's a, a very good way to close. Someone I mean, on their toilet? Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> hey, the Just the close end. That door. No, close but it. but no, but 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 seriously, I mean to Hugh's point, and I think it sums up everything that we're talking about here. If you want to write, write. Write to the readers. Write to the people to whom with whom you want to connect. They will connect with you. It's a symbiotic relationship. And eventually another little creature will come along in that nice symbiotic relationship and that will be the publisher who will say, hmm, I want to latch on to this and, you know, make you mine and then make the readers yours. And as we've all said, then you can go on and write poetry or bathroom jokes or, you know, whatever it is you might, you might want to write. But um, I want to thank everyone on the panel. I mean, this has been absolutely terrific. I'm sure if anyone here has any further questions, you'll see us all floating around here. Um, we'll be outside, I guess, you know, if you want to ask us questions. Um, so I want to thank you all. It's been a really terrific experience. And wish you all the best of luck and wish you all the best of luck uh, in all of your writing adventures. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.